podcast. I'm Annabelle Lambert. I'm here with my regular co-host uh, Rob Pye. Say hello Rob Pye. Hi hi. Um, absolutely uh, delighted today to be with another old friend which is uh, it's a, a growing theme but um, Lucy Green, uh, a, a very old friend of mine, now a pro- professorial fellow at the University of Southampton, uh, is I'm finding very difficult to say, but uh, is where she finds herself currently. Um, so I'm just going to jump straight in and ask Lucy to tell us a bit about herself, uh, where, what she's been up to uh, in her life and uh, where she finds herself now. Thanks, Annabelle. It's great to be chatting to you both today. Oh, about me. So um, I guess at at the heart of what I do really is me as a scientist with a passion for developmental physiology. I've I've spent a career studying how the environment created during the first thousand days of life. I mean, for me, that's meant from conception through pregnancy, how that environment affects the, the developing baby and its chances of health or should I say risk of a non communicable disease across its life course into later life and I spent a big chunk of my career in science labs doing experiments you know analyzing data writing grants papers teaching undergraduates and supervising research students and giving talks at conferences so in quite an academic bubble if you like um partly a sign of the times that I grew up as a scientist in but um and in a way kind of communicating in a in a albeit global but an echo chamber kind of of academic peers that you need a special ticket to get into um you know to get your voice heard so degrees and years of practice and so on so impact for me looked like published papers and grants that i got and possibly media coverage you know where journalists sort of digest and select stories that are of merit um, but for me, there's been quite a shift over the last 10 years. It was gradual at first and, and then sort of really quite substantial in the last kind of four years. That's put me in a, a really different working space um, with different methods and the mindset, you know, that's different. I'm not doing the research I was doing anymore, but I'm taking those concepts and thinking a bit broader um, about their meaning to people and to health. So it's meant me hanging up my white coat um, and talking to real people and writing in, in different ways as well. And and for one thing, that was a book for me, so, which was aimed at a public audience. And I guess it's got me kind of really forging new relationships outside that sort of academic bubble um, and finding myself working within the university system as well to help sort of make the impact of research real and responsive to, to people. Um, so ultimately, a bigger and more diverse team, really. I, lo- I, I love take, taking. Oh, well, Annabelle, sorry, um, I let you come in. Um, but where the first thousand days, you know, from how did it come about? Where, I mean, is it you know, did you have it as an early interest before your first degree? Where did that? Where did the research originate from? How did you get into it? Um, Can you well, remember? Yeah, back when um, Annabelle and I met, um, I was doing a degree in physiology at, at King's College in London um, quite a long time ago. And uh, and that's really where my, my interest in physiology started. Um, I, I could take you right back to childhood. I could do. I won't in a minute, but... <laughs> why that came about and how odd that was but um <laughs> i think uh i became interested in how the body worked i was interested in biology how the body worked and and um found myself after a degree in physiology um thinking what next and i started um, looking around for jobs actually I really wanted to travel to be honest but I couldn't afford it and I started looking around for jobs overseas and I thought well um how could I 
find one and I talked to one of my tutors and at, at, at university and he had access to a list of names and addresses and I just wrote off the most oh, jaw-droppingly naive letters to many people around the world and in running research groups and long story short land myself a job in the states at Cornell University working as a research assistant so this was literally you know I had a phone call I think I was in my dressing gown at the time late at night and this <laughs> research group leader phoned me up and said they thought they might have a job sight unseen really untested so that was a great leap of faith on their part and, and I went over there and started working their group was really um, interested in um, the physiology and the biology of pregnancy and birth and the processes of birth and it was there I got my first taste if you like of, of that sort of area of science and, and the possibilities there and through connections of the person running that group um, I found um, an opportunity for a PhD. I think I was ready by that point. I'd, I'd kind of got over the whole kind of incessant round of exams and um, examinations that you kind of do from school age through to university and I was ready for a bit more um, study. So I came back to the UK and did a PhD in fetal physiology. And so that really for me was a, the point at which I started to really look at, at some of this science of the first thousand days, the whole the life of the unborn baby. Um, and I was researching about how the unborn baby responds to changes in levels of oxygen in the mum and looking in quite, you know, very internal, very, very narrow focus of research, you know, about how the mechanisms that the, the blood supply going around the baby's body is controlled and the hormones and the, and the neuronal mechanisms, the nerves, the nerve system. Um, and um, really this, the next leap for me came um, when uh, after I, I, mean, I went off to Canada and worked for a couple of years there as well. But it was when I came back and, and possibly having had that amazing period in my 20s of traveling and doing all of that, it was when I came back to the UK that an opportunity came up to move to um, Southampton, the University of Southampton. And um, a man called David Barker had been working in Southampton as an academic clinician for many years and had made some fascinating observations that linked um, in, in, in the human population that linked um, size at birth in a cohort of um, men and women in Hertfordshire, the size of birth, these detailed birth records to risks of certain diseases in later life. So diabetes, um, coronary heart disease, for example. And notice that, that size across the normal birth weight range of babies, um, if you were smaller, but still within the normal birth weight range, you had a greater risk of one of these non-communicable diseases. And at those observations needed science to kind of support or refute them, back them up. And it was at that, on the basis of that, that the um, Southampton were recruiting people to come and um, build that science. And, and so my focus shifted towards kind of those adaptations that the unborn baby can make, um, how it puts the baby's body together and how it determines how that individual um, will respond to the world it finds itself in later life. Um, and actually sort of the ideas emerged and the concepts emerged that actually that was a really strong basis for why some of us fall foul of these so-called non-communicable diseases as we age um, um, and to a greater extent than others because a lot of this starts and is put down in place and when before we're even conscious of, of any sense of control you know during those first thousand days. So it's a very long-winded explanation of that. No, I'm mesmerised. I mean, I, <laughs> my, I, 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 even, even go on. Annabelle's going to ask the question, I was just saying. But no, no, you, you the, asked my the... question. You asked my question. I, I, I was digging for the when did it first come? You know, when did with science hit you? But we, we, you, you, you've answered that. Yeah. You know, we don't need to go back to where I was going to. But um, I, I, I was fascinated when your book came out because I... I an, old, an English teacher of all things once said to me that, the, and I remembered it quite strongly, that the first two years of your life are when most things happen to you. You matter how you are, what happens to you in those first two years makes a lot of who you are when you get older. So then when you added the extra, you know, 
bit, nine months. Uh, yeah, the extra nine months on that. I, 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 a fascinating subject as to. Well, it, I mean, what, and it's that, in reality, what what you know? Do we have any control over that? Do these things make a difference? You know, and what 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 brings about you know an individual is just incredibly fascinating. But yeah. I think those first nine months, you know, inside the womb are often, you know, there's this sense that it's kind of, in theatrical terms, it's 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 stage right, isn't it? It's sort of, you know, out of sight and actually, <laughs> you know, we deal, right. in, <laughs> we deal kind of in, um, in, in big milestones during pregnancy. You know, you go for that first kind of booking of trimesters. Yeah. first scan, you know, you're quite focused on, on quite rightly, on, on, producing a viable baby at term a baby that will thrive and, and these are all really important milestones but actually um i think our book was about just sort of putting before people the kind of the bits in between what's actually happening behind you know offset um behind the scenes um and those amazing things that are developing i mean you know the fact that these wonders of development in those first thousand days, the fact that we build, we make all the heart cells we're going to ever need for life. You know, the fact that you make all the kidney cells that you're going to need to keep your kidneys filtering um, your blood and producing urine for the whole of your life. The muscle cells, skeletal muscle cells, you know, which are eventually what what will sense blood glucose circulating around your body, and you know, and is a component of how resistant or sensitive you are to insulin they're all formed, you know, prenatally wow. as well. And, and, you know, so getting it right is, is quite important. Um, getting it right is probably the wrong way to put it. Getting it, getting the best possible version of right is, is, is really important. And I think that's where understanding the science and communicating that science to people, I think, is quite um, having them involved in that conversation is quite important to me about sort of how you take everyone on that journey, introduce the science to people, get people thinking about it, because on the basis of that, um, changes um, can happen, um, whether it's in personal control over the future of the next generation or whether it's actually as a member of the public being able to influence what you want to see as changes in policies to help support um that best start to life preconceptionally i think is really you know really important people are part of that solution so so how much and this is somebody who's never considered the subject ever before this interview <laughs> the nature and nurture of it you mm. talk about fetal size um so there, there was a lady who was waiting us in skiing um who was smoking and i found it very difficult not to say anything um there's a, a whole moral dilemma in you know nutrition lifestyle you know i i would imagine that i'm guessing but that would be in your research or in terms of nutrition and you know correlations to lifestyle factors and the genetics and fam family history and is that is that all part of the so, it's all part of the the territory for sure i think um i think the first thing to say is i think we've all grown you know um been not all of us but for many people if you ask them what it is that determines their risk of you know or their chances of health or their risk of disease would probably point to things like you know um lifestyle choices or genetics um and i think what's what one starts to realize when you look at the situation is that there are stories that we all hear you know there's a there's a lester jailer back in the 1800s i think who who you know was um uh, um significantly um obese and was written up widely in um um, in, in sort of medical journals and observed by um, clinicians as to be sort of, you know, about his body and his general um, state of health, you know, that his physiology was normal and, and people were, you know, as an oddity, you know, not, you know, poked at as a kind of a figure of kind of, you know, of wonder, but reported that, you know, led a very abstemious 
lifestyle, you know, took moderate exercise, didn't drink excessively, didn't do this, but people find it very hard to believe um, that type of scenario. So, you know, couldn't believe that it wasn't something that, that was in that person's control. Mm. Um, and then you have another situation like, you know, that hits the press every now and again of somebody that's lived to the age of 100, but, you know, in one particular case was reported to eat if it lived a life and enjoying cream cakes and, and everything like that, like somehow that that was... 40 a day. <laughs> there you go. See, it's all right to eat all of that because look at this person. They've managed mm. to do it. And, you know, we... I then... I, actually, when, I, when I'd when i give lectures on this, I... I I, I, I use my late father as, a, as an example, um, who passed away last year, but had us all on our toes for, you know, probably a decade, to be honest, at least, 20, let's say, 20 years of kind of, of um, cardiovascular health issues, you know, and he was quite the bon viveur, loved his, you know, loved food, didn't really, wasn't a great fan of exercise, you know, lived life to the full. And um and I was likened to the fact that he had a cardiovascular system of a doily, really. I mean, you know, he went from one crease to another. And um, we used to wag our fingers at him and say, you know, you really should sort of sort yourself out, you know, shape up, you know, um, do something about this, you know. Come on, just get a grip, get some control over all of this. But when I heard about the science that sort of, you know, and started working within this science and heard about those observations of, of you know, David Barker, as I was talking about, you know, you start to think, actually, well, we're being a bit harsh on him. You know, in fact, maybe a lot of what was going on stemmed back to when he was an embryo <laughs> and what was happening to him during his lifetime. So I think it's quite difficult. The lifestyle and the diet thing, you know, you know, there are government initiatives, aren't there, about eat well yeah. schemes, you know, eat well plate and, and taxation on sugary foods. And you think, well, why, you know, the results of those um, initiatives can be quite disappointing or perplexing, you know, why it works for one person and not the other. And then people turn to genetics and, and, and think, well, surely there's got to be a genetic explanation for this. Um, and and there have been studies looking to sort of show, um, show links. And I'm not a geneticist, but I think when, when the um, um, Human Genome Project kicked off, and 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 the whole se you know the genome was sequenced. People, I think, thought that they were going to find all the answers to the for the basis of disease in in that sequence. And I think it was, you know, written up in 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 Nature as kind of you know the the the, the you know the disappointment that this had you know hadn't proved to be the case, and almost like this missing heritability. And, and actually, when people try and look for those linkages, it doesn't account for a terribly large proportion of the risk of certain things like diabetes. So it's not all the answer. And I think what's emerged from the field that I work in, it, um, and a lot of the work not done by me, <laughs> um, a lot of what's emerged is, is this, you know, it's not genes. It's not just genes. It's not just lifestyle. It's a combination of the two. And this so-called epigenetics um, I don't know if it's a term you've ever heard of, but you know this idea of the environment is um, leaving its mark, if you like, on the more permanent sort of genetic code that we're dealt by our parents. Um, and that as you then develop over the course of development, um, things like nutrition, which is what you mentioned a minute ago, Rob, you know, that, that actually leaves small marks on the genetic, on that permanent genetic code, these epigenetic marks, which can then change how those genes work, how they express the proteins that make our body work um, in all its wondrous ways. So I think that's the territory that I'm operating in. How fantastic. How I answered like a true scientist, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, as with my business days, go, eat less cakes and you'll be fine. And it's, uh, it's like more complicated than that. But it's not, is it? I can't have a Mars right. bar every day for lunch. It goes straight to my hips. And I know that, you know, um, <laughs> many people I know can. And that seems, feels unjust. And actually, I think part of what this science is doing is to actually hopefully help people not not to give up the sense of control but to understand the way the body is responding to the world I mean, there's certainly it. yeah there's certainly a development if you if you look at it from the sort of diet nutrition health lifestyle you know and entity the things that are going on you you see there's things coming through now which are really about that of individual 
purporting to be individually focused so they you know they assess you you and your what you what they are assessing in you and then tell you how to respond to what you you are <laughs> rather than this do this doctor, it, it is, yeah it's very personal we're talking about a form of personalized you know an element of personalized medicine mm. in a sense it's yeah, actually yeah, appreciating yeah. that 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 can happen i mean the reality is, of course, is that you you know what you don't well not the reality, but what you don't want to to do is 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 for people to come away with a sense of of doom that somehow it's all the die is cast that actually well what can I do? No, you know, I mean, no, you know, no. it's actually I think instead sort of it's handled in the correct way and with the right policies and with the right focus of this. It, it's a story of optimism. It's a story of kind of potential for for the next generation to come. And I think a lot of the work that is going on in Southampton, um, which I can tell you about, um, uh, but and some of the focus that I've had in sort of the ways I've tried to kind of talk to members of the public about this kind of research are, are really focused on, on, on helping people to understand it as this at a point in their life course where they can not only act on, you know, their health and their healthy choices for the benefit themselves, but actually for the future generations to come. So I guess um, I'm not talking in code here. I'm talking about kind of young people and, um, you know, potentially adolescence is, is the, is the space in which you can have a, a huge impact on, on uh, through talking about this. And might, might that be, you know, intergenerationally cumulative, you know, like in in um, life chances, so, you know, social welfare, social justice, that, that you know, there's a, there's a lot of research about family history, you know, being a, a, an incredible predictor of life chances. So this epigenetics and laying down biomarkers genetically, you know, is that... Um, that that you you could imagine the research being endless on that, which I guess is why it's so far taken you quite a lot of your career thinking about this stuff. It's just fascinating. It's mind bending, isn't it? Yeah. So no, you're quite right, and I think there is this um, the inter intergenerational kind of legacy of the choices you know, of choices made. Um, are... It's all my grandfather's fault. That explains so much, you know. I mean, like... We're all walking in our grandmother's footsteps, you know, it's uh, and grandfather's. <laughs> it's there, yeah, absolutely. The intergenerational thing and this epigenetic basis of it provides a way in which that can transmit across generations, and so I think that's really important. It's a, it's an incredibly complex situation. Everything, you know, the world is changing constantly around us, um, and the drivers and the pathways through which disease happens is 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 changing over time but um these concepts you know provide a pathway through you know the world is becoming progressively you know more the burden of obesity internationally is 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 getting larger you know and larger markers of you know you know um of social and economic D deprivation mm. are, are huge factors within this and actually understanding that that, that is a a driver but one can't solely ex expect you know people to the burden of this responsibility to rest on people it has to rest in 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 the hands of people who have um the ability to make that change as well and put in you know places in place strategies to to help um make that a reality for people and not let i mean i think this is lifestyle drift or something terminology where you know you make a change but actually inevitably the burden of responsibility falls back onto individuals alone and i think that's a danger point i mean you also mentioned fathers um which is um something that i sometimes you know get challenged on quite rightly at these science festivals that i i do um throughout the year um a lady once came up to me and said, oh, you know, this is just an, another example of, you know, the burden responsibility for health resting with women. And um, and I said, yeah, no, you're you're quite right. But in fact, you know, the field has actually shifted. The field of research has shifted substantially over the years to really start to look at lifestyle factors of 
future father expectant fathers and um, before pregnancy and actually how that can actually um, through epigenetics as well through the sperm mark letters on the sperm transmit into offspring and and, and influence their future health and um, after birth so i think that that focus is 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 very important because it can't be this kind of um pencil maneuver on women to actually sort of solve the health of the nation and it requires both partners both part and society i mean there's um the um strategy for women's health has been a great boon you know obviously that the, the inclusion of um diet and non-communicable diseases and um, women and children within the sustainable development goals but then also um last i think it was uh, 20 oh, i can't remember what year it was anyway the strategy for women's health which was very recent um august 22 i think um there was a, a good move in the right direction for that and i think there's just been a recent sort of uh um, press announcement around women's health priorities for 2024 that's come out from the government and and actually within that is a is a focus on prenatal and pregnancy care which is really welcomed i think by everyone in this in this field this opportunity to actually make um make better the provision of health care and for the best possible start is, is really important there's some stuff way back on contraception in um, developing countries and actually one of the outcomes I think they observe was um, healthier society not not for clinical reasons but for women empowerment reasons so when women I can't remember the study the details just the essence of what I remember is that it, by introducing free contraception women felt more empowered to actually make positive lifestyle choices about uh, childbirth and that had very very positive socioeconomic effects rather than being on the back foot for mm -hmm. unwanted pregnancies or unplanned pregnancies or um, unaffordable uh, other other so I, I wonder this is lead long-windedly leading into a question <laughs> that says in in academia where do you draw the lines because you on the one hand you've got the massive specialization you know which is just like awesome um your 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 um, thesis on your phd for example but um then you're into sociology you're into law you're into finance you're into sort of other uh, fields that may have influences in terms of the first thousand days even if you limited public you, you know, health, to that yeah. first you know the, all the public yeah and and you know you're into public health coronavirus or pandemics or mm. um, there's, there's so there's so much in it, isn't it? You could take the whole context. Where do you draw the yes. lines? Is that? I'm not sure I, I, I know how to draw lines, but I know that this is <laughs> like a, this is not just me interested in this type of um, this type of work. And actually, you know, in, in terms of understanding the um, economies, the economy and economic wins from making interventions like that will you know require it requires health economists to be involved the lines being drawn i think i'm not sure whether i'm this is what you mean but i do note that the um, strategy for women's health had a very strong thread running through that about the involve, importance of involving communities in delivering um, against this type of work and um, for me, that really struck a chord because I felt that, in fact, you know, um, finding ways, finding the voices of people who are um, living, living the life um, um, and bringing those into um, front and centre to actually how you implement change is, is really important. This whole kind of co-production of um, you know, which Children. range, <laughs> which range from you know, in in medical research, from everything from kind of you know service design through to trial design through to now, people are really trying to wrestle with how that kind of involvement and, and co production of you know even in the space of non clinical research, how that can work better. I think is is a really important one. So I think the lines get drawn have to get drawn. Um, through an open and honest dialogue, I think, with the people to whom this this work matters. 
So yeah. in some senses, this is actually hard, the hard one to put your finger on, because of course, who does it matter to here then, and you know, here right now or in the future? But of course, you know, you, you know, when people are, are pregnant, that matters to them. Um, but when people um, become part of the dialogue who are potentially future parents, that's also important because that sort of sets a tone, it sets a dialogue going, which is going to inform kind of the direction of travel. So young people, again, really important. There's a, there's a really um, fabulous um, one of, on my pathway to getting involved in sort of public engagement was by being one of the meet the scientists at, at a, a lunchtime break. Um, for um, school children who had been bussed in oh. by the to um, the university hospital site and um, to bespoke laboratories of Life Lab, which is a, um, as I say, they've got custom built laboratories. Young people come in and they learn about the science behind what makes them healthy. And um, and it, it's a research project, really. So it's actually understanding how that sort of approach could lead to changes in, in behaviour around health for themselves, but also future generations. And so I was kind of part of that Meet the Scientist sort of um, sessions and, and um, you know, really important um, places and spaces to, to talk to young people about, oh, you always like to be a scientist, but also about some of these these ideas and 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 getting them part of that conversation. And, and the, you know, there are other ways in which that, that programme, the Life Lab programme, are then involving young people as part of the, um, and I think this is what your company does as well, isn't it? Um, you know, is putting young people right at the centre of those decision-making processes and researching our big ideas. So... Um, really important. Yeah, and it and it plays, you know, in terms of our themes, the theme of community. You know, mm. bo bottom up action research. You know, just like mm. how do you actually involve um, involve beneficiaries? You know, uh, in in experimenting and learning. Um, yeah, I mean, this, yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, I just, I just, you know, the, the school children bit, bit. Yeah. and so it, it, outside the academic curriculum, really, of, you know, you have to get qualifications and study and just sort of do memory recall stuff. There's a, there's a several projects um, that we're sponsoring mm. involving schools, and, and one is a, um, a group of scientists who, who go in and, what is it, it's, it's not, at six, six, seven, eight year olds getting them to experiment about going to Mars and here's all these and, yeah. you know, doing drawings and the, the sort of inspiration and innovation that comes out of those school children when you can go, okay, mm -hmm. we'll draw some pictures if you know, had a particle accelerator and, mm -hmm. you know, these things and what we're doing this research and that. And then they're drawing these incredible... Um, and we're working with a, another uh, mm -hmm. charity. There's a lady called Maggie Philbin um, mm -hmm. and she was the producer of... Uh, presenter on tomorrow's world no, again it's about new technology <laughs> and she's a great childhood inspiration for, yeah. for me and she's going around schools helping children not not get qualifications but how would you use this technology so i think that the community mm -hmm. stuff and the the action research is very it's important to sponsor to fund to get that energy into the sort of extracurricular mm. co-curricular i mean i think yeah things. i think i think the 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 you know i think there's a lot of um i feel there's there's a big shift coming in education and i think what's interesting is you know what you just described lucy with the you know buzzing in the school children and this is an exciting day out but i think helping people communicating you know this public engagement bit that you do it is about educating as to things that you'll never you know you'll never learn in the classroom because it's not it's not foundational chemistry or physics or biology but it matters to you as an individual you know and what you can yeah. learn so and, and that period you talked about through those adolescent years mm -hmm. when you're very uh, influenced by things I think you know you're, you're still a sponge enough to to take things on board and either go yes I, I feel that I am going to do that or go no that's a load of rubbish I'm going to ignore that for a while and then you know down the line pick it up again I, I think it's sort of very important that we continue to do all these things I think education will change massively and will become healthier you know, uh, for people. Yeah, no, no, here, 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 here. I think one of the things to point out that I've learned over the, you know, um, and try to sort of, you know, uh, through example of the the people in Life Lab 
for one is is to keep it keep eff um, efforts made to outreach and engage kind of consistent and in step with the curriculum to acknowledge that teachers have um, very limit tough jobs and limited yeah, yeah. time so, absolutely and i watch with admiration as they as they work with teachers to actually help build those skills and help fit around and, and weave it into the, that kind of structure so and i think you know um I've tried over, the, you know, pre-pandemic, we managed to have like a good three years of these events where we opened up our labs as well to young people um, at a slightly, the slightly older age. So these guys were like A-level, first year A-level stages. And it was kind of an open day event. They got to experience real lab, exp lab experiences, um, hands-on, you know, talk to mentors um, about what it was like to be a scientist or a medic, because I'm in a faculty of medicine. Um, and then we helped them come up with questions. Um, for a subsequent public facing question time like event, you know, like BBC <laughs> question time. But, um, and they were the young people in the audiences asking questions of a kind of a sparkly panel of experts around huge topics. You know, one was toxic, another one was building superhumans and and um, another one was around fake food. And um, actually what you're doing in hopefully in that event was to put young people's voices front and center as being driving the questions and i think that's another huge part of this is actually giving the space for that you know um dare i say the youth voice to kind of have prominence in in, in this in this was really powerful and something that we want to keep going you know um and, and i do feel this this community this this community voice that you've talked about you know is I'm learning constantly in, in my role as it, as it evolves, you know, about that territory. You know, I'm surrounded by some people who are doing fantastic amounts of work in that space. And, and I'm, I'm in a project at the moment with Southampton Voluntary Services um, where we're um, exploring this kind of um, concept of co-production in these kind of, around some big, you know, issues that are relevant to communities and exploring ways of working, you know, as a joint university you know um, voluntary sector projects so i think that's exciting um but learning all the time you know i mean i look back and, and chuckle to myself you know and think about sort of 10 years ago thinking you know this is great this is real change you know i'm just sort of you know expanding floundering my way around in in discovering new areas and new ways of working really We've got a podcast as well, um, which is um, called, they're called Collaboratively, Collab I can't even say that, Collaboratively <laughs> Speaking with Us, and us being, you know, University of Southampton. So Southampton, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Neat. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and that's really sort of exploring that relationship that we, that, that exists between public contributors to research and people from the university sector who come together and how they've worked effectively to kind of remove that sort of um, power any power imbalances and um, you know have developed their relationship in working out some kind of tough squiggly kind of problems in medical research and um, and that's been quite exciting hearing hearing those kind of those stories from people of how they've done it. I'm also trying to be sort of help our institution be a bit, you know, be brave, um, I guess, as an institution, you know, um, as a faculty to sort of support and, and highlight those things that are being done really well um, and, and get help people just explore doing more of it. Um, we've got a, a scheme that, that was sort of co-produced scheme actually um for recognizing public who contribute to research or education that's being done within our faculty walls and and you know okay it's a certificate but it comes with a kind of testimonial if you like which is from a researcher or a student who who's you know saying acknowledging the strengths and skills that have been brought to that partnership and 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 we then um invite some of those nominees to come back and be judges at our faculty research conference and so of their lay infographic presentations and so there's a very nice kind of cycle of intrigue that's developing really whereby we're, we're trying to i'm trying to sort of foster that being embedded into our lifeblood as, as a research culture really um, I'm going to go out on a limb with this next question, which has just come to me again on the community. So, <laughs> What's your favourite colour? Here it goes. Here it is. Um, so, so what about childbirth? Um, and, and I'm thinking, 
I'm thinking home, you know, clinical interventions, hospitals, um, water birth, NCT, the social, you know, the community context around that. Is that does that feature as a big part of um, your research? Has it is it sort of insignificant? Is it um, not a major focus? So I've, I've asked the question now. I don't know whether I'm um, uh, it's on topic or not, but there you go. Um, no, it, well, I tell you what, it doesn't um, necessarily feature in, in my research, but um, so anything I say is really just from personal kind of choices and experiences that I've had, really. So I don't even know whether you just want me to stop talking at this point. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, so in terms of being a computer science, I could, on, a, on a scale of one to ten, I think you give me an answer one there. But I, I just. No, but I, you know, I, I tell you what, I can, I can say that. Um, when I approached childbirth and therefore, you know, and I think actually this is a good chance for me to say something else that I wanted to about blurred lines and, and um, between me as me and me as a working professional, really. But when I approached childbirth, I think um, I was, I had in the back of my head all of these things that I knew about the labs I'd worked in and the research that was going on, which made me really risk averse, actually. Um, it made me really want to... Um, um, on a personal level, be feel quite sort of um, tended to be want to be medicalized when it came to kind of giving birth. So my reflections are is that you know what I knew and what I was hearing about had got me so close to the topic that I was I was sort of affected by that, and and the choices I made were affected by that. So perhaps that's a living embodiment of the power of of of, of um, knowledge and. <laughs> over over choices and 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 decisions that are made by people so i i'm not i can't i don't think i can necessarily give you a kind of a balanced academic appraisal of of kind of those you know the pros and cons of of knowledge in that space but that's my certainly my experiences but it does mean me make me reflect again as i said on the space i find myself in and not just me but others um who work in my sector about sort of work, work self um, and other self, you know, that um, the blurred boundaries. And I think as, as scientists and researchers, um, we're, as we're encouraged and to do more work out in spaces which are not necessarily just in the kind of four walls of the institution, you're finding yourself in spaces and talking to people where you're you're giving yourself more to a conversation and and actually it's a really interesting shift which I'm not you know I think requires keeping up with as 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 institutions as to helping people it's the training it's the kind of skills training it's the understanding how to can have conversations with with people and to listen um but also understand where you're you know what do you take of you into that and and not and i'm not sure i've got any of the answers but i'm sort of learning and and navigating as i go on this one mm. i mean I, I think that you know whatever those cognitive biases are we can't you can you can't you know it's almost impossible to detect them isn't it you've got to, you 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 know whether you choose to be completely open and bring your whole self or not you know you you've little control about the fact that you're bringing everything that's happened to you up to this point to the conversation mm. um whether you're aware of it or not you've been influenced <laughs> you know again epigenetically by your grandfather grandmother and all you know these other you know you're bringing all of that to mm. the conversation and you can't just mm. e even with the discipline of a scientific inquiry you can't eliminate um all of those biases no you can't you so, can't, so that, you can't I, I think, remove all the biases yeah. but you can it's what, i think what's interesting to me is that you know for my early career i kind of developed in a in a setting which was sort of you know measured and and sort of laboratory and it felt sort of like I'd, you know, either I'd created or it was just the kind of place at the time, which was not like a fortress, but it, it sort of you feel like you're in this kind of bubble and, and it feels like 
the landscape has really changed. It's not just me sort of cannonballing my way out of that fortress. It's it's the fact that around me, the climate has changed, you know, the expectations on people to communicate and to engage have changed, but people are getting more skilled at it and, and realising that the benefits that that can bring back and and it's about sort of then i think we're in a we're in a at a time where people are you know there are protocols and methods for this but also haven't quite i suppose thought about all the kind of ways in which you you sort of then need to you know what is work you know what is in play you know where are the two you know when you're out in a space you know what does that mean i, I, I think it's just some really interesting kind of head scratching moments for people um where to draw and, and i think you meant you mentioned in just before the interview um i want to pick that up because it's one of our passions you know what is work what is play but um mm. you know we we've we've um we've developed from a you know uh, last couple of hundred years uh an economy and a society of of focused on labor labor and jobs labor being um i give you money you give me time you know here's some money you know there that's a job a job a job and yet we can do work um that we're passionate about that engages us intellectually that you know we have emotional and all sorts of it you know maybe that doesn't pay it's not a labor exchange where you're doing a unit of output and being a parent is a good example of that or being a um, participant in a community or being a being a volunteer and I think that the um, you know we 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 still have a system that pr primarily is driven by that the sort of eco um, economics of um, labor you know I give you money you give me time for some particular output um, and yes. before the interview, you were talking about being involved in academic institutions and having a little bit more freedom to be less than, you know, profit centred or focused on very narrow, narrow outcomes and, and objectives. Um, and I, I wonder, I wonder, um, has that been part of, you know, what, what you're doing now, public engagement, developing, you know, so how has that, how has that come about in terms of, this the one life you know what you're pushing to do at the moment where your interests are is that um is that is that something that was conscious you know is a, do you want to just talk a little bit about what you're doing now and why you're doing that gosh that's a big a big uh <laughs> territory but i mean i grew up in in a university life where um at a time before the research assessment frameworks at a time before you know people were metricizing everything so it was a luxury numbers 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 <laughs> yeah you know publish or die you know um and it was a publish or die but the, the metrics were different and um and i think so that's that's part of my my sort of context and uh, for me as a person you'll not believe me because i sit you know i've got a mortgage you know and i've got stuff but i've never been the, my motivator has never been um money or power i didn't see that i didn't have like by the time i'm x age i want to be this i didn't really i couldn't see that far i've been sort of more of a kind of a a grabber of opportunity and then just kind of pursue it which you know it might have slowed me down who knows but that's that's what I am um I'm trying to unpick all the things that you've you've talked about um so I think now um this idea of um remuneration for what we do is is really fascinating to me and um for people who join and become the us the bigger the wider team doing research there's actually a, a quite a, an evolved sort of mechanism now um, that universities subscribe to as well for reimbursing people for time that when they give up time to get involved, um, acknowledging that people can't just magically kind of find room in their working lives or you can't assume that people can can find the resource to contribute their voice to a conversation and to be part of medical research. So, you know, there are there are guidelines to follow about kind of hour by hour remuneration, which I think is a really positive thing because I think it it's not about assuming that people have to have something back, but it's about actually just acknowledging that there may be barriers 
for them to be able to get involved in the first place. So I do think that's really important. Um, for me now... Well, an an inter interruption, which is why we're so passionate about basic income. So actually, mm. how could, where, where the money is a barrier, if you remove that barrier, then you actually have the freedom to explore and to pursue mm. things that mean something to you for their own sake, not mm. for the sake of a financial exchange. So I think that's a, that's a sort of a beautiful part of the yeah. mm. myth that I was getting to. And, mm. and, uh, you know, yeah. and I think you, you talked a bit about the freedom within university, mm. you know, being an academic. I think it's, it, you know, so I think, yes, I think there's still, an, there's still a spirit there of, of being um, empowered, you know, at a certain point in your career to be able to pursue a line of thought. And I don't think I would be talking to you now about the things I'm talking to you about if that hadn't been the case, to be honest, you know, I mean, you know, a journey of trying to pick up, uh, you know, um, pick up on a thread of public engagement, pursuing that to sort of setting things up and being allowed that sort of space to, to develop things um, and then, you know, I, my appointment, the position I've got is fairly recent. And it's through sort of the system being able to acknowledge that this is a that knowledge exchange and and, and you know community public and community engagement is a, a really important thread now that runs through certainly my institution and many others. Um, and it is an acknowledgement of that, you know, that in fact it's a big part of it. So I think you know the systems um, are, seem to me there to support. The metrics are still there gnawing at us perpetually as to how, you know, whether it's actually um, beneficial to the institution, but um, I think they'll, they'll never go away. <laughs> evidence-based, evidence-based. <laughs> I'm very, very conscious of the time. We are 51 min minutes in. <laughs> yes. um, so um, just being mindful of that. Um, so I, I think what, what we would um, might ask now, Lucy, normally of people at this ending, closing uh, phase is what, what, you know, what can, can anybody do to support, help, you know, move forward, you know, what you're, what, what you're doing, where you are, um, you <laughs> <laughs> I'm it's a really it, it's a tough one so what can anyone do I can what I can do to help anyone is I guess is my next steps I suppose is trying to um keep um working in my space to show visibility of what's excellent to others around me to students who are coming through either on undergraduate postgraduate taught or phd programs to show what the possibilities are um by example of others who are doing working well in this space to keep on providing opportunities to people for skills to encourage uh, well, to have myself to keep talking wide to people in different sectors to across the arts and who are working and doing excellent engagement um, through to other disciplines to keep talking wide and also keep talking wide at the community level. I'm really excited by, you know, working with people in the voluntary sector and and other community-based groups as I am at the moment to kind of explore ways of working that's been really good and I suppose you know I, I suspect what you're trying to get me to do is to sort of you know it's almost like you know tips hints and tips for others and I just can't I just don't even know where to start but I do um I do think it's in, in this space it's about sort of um trying to find the time to weave it into the work that's being done you know what is appears to be core business there never seems to be, and that's probably one of the things that stopped me in the first place, there never seems to be time, the pressures that you are under to deliver um, against objectives which seem to be hard and purposeful. Sometimes this type of work, when you're engaging and involving publics in it, has been perceived to be soft and, um, and just a distraction 
and um, mm, interesting what the culture has changed and it is changing and actually um, I'm excited that, that there's the possibility of introducing others and enabling others to actually take part in this sort of dialogue whether you're moving tiny amounts of liquid from one tube to another doing molecular biology in a lab or whether you're doing a, a clinical trial I think that the, the culture now for research is is is, is sort of involving a huge number of different people so really just to keep everybody um enthused to actually get some skills in doing that um is, is really one of the things i'd like to do mm. Mm. excellent okay bite rob do you have anything final you want to ask before we uh, say thank you well, it's just it's been the quickest hour um yeah it's, it's just one of those subjects i feel that we probably need we at least on. four hours just do an introduction. I didn't even get to tell you my chemistry kit story. Anyway. <laughs> Next oh, time. We need to know. I need to know now. <laughs> okay. Go <laughs> on. No, 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 no. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> I, I found that really refreshing, enlightening, uh, informative, entertaining um and you know in a, in a way I, I hadn't expected it to be so it was, thank you very I, much i really enjoyed that. i want you yeah i i want you to come back in a few years when you've had more experience out there with the world and people and you have <laughs> sort of begun begun to answer your own question as to how to manage that you know being oneself because you're just yourself when you're out there and it's like where where and why and if you want to draw the lines where and how and if did you actually choose to draw them so um it's a, it's an interesting uh journey that you're on there with the uh we, all we, right with well engagement. <laughs> challenge accepted you're on <laughs> well it was very interesting well i mean it was interesting because because ian had done ian our, our friend a, a previous podcast uh orthopedic oh. surgeon had had some community they were changing the way they delivered their service and had had oh. some community engagement about before changing it to to sort of say this is what we're proposing how was it received by the community and uh, he 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 it was a wonder to him when he went. He didn't know what he was expecting. But but these amazing people, you know, turn up to join in in the community mm -hmm. and tell you what they think and tell you what they feel. And it was a quite a pleasant experience, you know, a supportive, mm -hmm. uh, contributive. It was, you know, and, and I think, you know, I, I think sometimes sort of that public engagement gets it's, a bad it's press. In, but... <laughs> it's intensely surprising. I mean, the spaces yeah. I've operated in, in terms of, from everything recently around end of life care and mistrust in that in a, in a community in Southampton mm. and, and putting myself in, into those conversations and mm. with people has been so enlightening and, and the ability to share and the willingness to share through back to where I started at Science Days, you know, where I would meet people with my giant game of Kaplunk, which was a huge unashamed visual metaphor for the development. And, um, <laughs> and you know talking with people about this type of work and just seeing that amazement and then the sort of assimilation into their life and then sort of you know actually wanting to know what action to take i think it can be incredibly powerful to you as a scientist and and as a you know um, in generally in this space and really understanding what the best next move is for that research i think it's it is it is powerful mm. excellent Definitely well, over an uplifting that. note. <laughs> I'd like to say thank you, thank you, thank you for so much for uh, coming to talk with us. It, as Rob said, it's been uh, as wonderful as I was expecting. <laughs> well, the pleasure so, all mine. Thank you very much for the yeah. invite. Lovely. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you. All right. Bye.